Welcome to Macroeconomics 101, or shall I say CIA 4U1. Today I'm going to teach you how the chocolate bar in your backpack can not only help feed you, but it can also help feed your economy. Let's start off by saying that when you bought that chocolate bar, you were probably craving it a lot, and the store was willing to supply it to you for just a little cash. Just multiply that by every item and service in our country, and you have macroeconomics. I could take a good guess and say that that chocolate bar was made because of a little thing I like to call capitalism. Capitalism motivated someone to innovate and invest into a business that grew and eventually came to make one of your most favorite delicious snacks. With capitalism comes poor income distribution. They say the rich gets richer and the poor get poorer. You could end up like this if you have one of the top 25% highest incomes owning more than 45% of Canada's total income. Or you could end up like this in the bottom 25% owning just over 7% of Canada's total in income. Of course, this is absolute poverty, and there are certain levels of poverty based on where you live. In Canada, the poverty level is under $30,000 annually, where the world's poverty level is under $450 annually. As you can see, absolute poverty has a substantially lower income across the world, rather than just in Canada. Relative poverty would not be this extreme. It would just consist of you not being able to buy that so long desired chocolate bar and instead putting the money towards your necessities. These are the downsides to capitalism, but on the upside, it can also help decrease poverty levels by increasing economic growth. Innovation and motivation can help create new technologies which can improve our quality of life, such as discovering a new medical breakthrough. With this new technology arise new companies competing for the market. These businesses create jobs for unemployed citizens. This helps decrease the unemployment rate within our country. Currently, Canada's unemployment rate is approximately 7.4%. We would like to achieve our full employment rate, which is between 6 and 7%. You could be considered unemployed, possibly, if you only have a summer job, or maybe you don't even work at all. The way we can determine who is considered unemployed is from the four different types. Some of you might be looking for a first job soon after finishing your education. This would make you frictionally unemployed. Possibly you only work in the summer, making you seasonally unemployed the rest of the year. This could also be applied to, say, an air conditioning repairman since they are not needed within the winter. Another type of unemployment is structural. Structural is due to a mismatch between people and jobs. You might be working in a factory and get replaced by a computer because it's simply more efficient. The last and Possibly the worst type is cyclical. This is due to a decrease in demand for a job, making businesses decrease production, causing people to lose jobs. Most of you know about the job cut in the auto industry during the recession. This was because the demand for cars had decreased because they were so expensive, and the car companies did not need to produce as many cars, so they cut a lot of their workers, such as GM. You may ask what affects our overall unemployment. Well. A well-known economist called A.W. Phillips helped us better understand how the unemployment rate fluctuated. He explained that an inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment, the higher the inflation, the lower the unemployment rate. Let's see how inflation affects your life today. Inflation is determined from a basket of goods called the Consumer Price Index, or the CPI. It is consisted of a broad 600 goods and services that the average household uses. So your chocolate bar might very well be inside this basket. Most things you buy contribute to the CPI, whenever you go to a movie or you buy some cereal and milk for the week, and an increase in the price of the basket goods determines our inflation rate. You most likely bought that chocolate bar for about a dollar, unless of course you went to the Dollarama. You know, two for one, what could be better? Well, next year, the price of that chocolate bar will most likely be approximately a dollar and three cents. This is due to our inflation rate, which is hovering at about 3.3%, even though our inflation control target is about 2%, which we are trying to achieve. Let's go back in time and see how inflation would have affected that chocolate bar during the Great Depression. Well, in 1930, your chocolate bar would decrease by 30% in value in just one year. This is due to deflation. This means that in two years, your one dollar could get you two chocolate bars. I wonder what Dollarama would do then. Now that you have seen the Great Depression, let's go over to Zimbabwe. In 2008, Zimbabwe has an inflation rate that is just over 231,150,000%. If this isn't hyperinflation, then I don't know what is. Instead of having $1 bills in your pocket, you need $100 billion bills just to buy that chocolate bar. 
aren't you glad we live in Canada because we have never experienced hyperinflation? There are two causes to these inflations, either cost push inflation or demand pull inflation. Let's go back to Mr. Businessman and his Hershey factory. Now the cost of those cocoa beans has been going up lately, and I'm pretty sure if you were one of his workers, you would want a higher wage. This means his production cost is increasing, causing him to raise the price of that chocolate bar. This is cost push inflation. Since the price of that product is increasing due to the cost in production, or he might just be a little greedy and be trying to get more revenue. Now, demand pull inflation is when our aggregate demand starts to shift right while we're inside the inflationary gap in the aggregate supply curve, but I'll get to that later. Our government has methods of controlling the inflation rate. Haven't you noticed Canada always seems to do better on a recession than the US? As you know, our inflation control target is 2%, and our government is using fiscal and monetary policy to aim to achieve this rate. Here is fiscal policy in a nutshell. Well, we have our circular flow of income, and you know, we get our services and goods from factories in return for money, and we provide them with labor resource for income and payment. Well, following Adam Smith's theory of the invisible hand, this flow should keep our economy going, but after seeing what happened during the Great Depression, I think we needed a change. The government decided to use fiscal policy to help stabilize the economy when in need. They do this by using injections and withdrawals. Injections consist of government spending, and withdrawals consist of taxing corporations and households. Let's look at it like a bucket with a hole. The government pours water, which is the government spending, into the bucket, while the hole in the bottom of the bucket is the taxes, which decreases the amount. By increasing or decreasing government spending and taxes, they can shift our aggregate demand left and right, which allows them to manipulate inflation rates. This brings us to aggregate demand, the most fundamental concept of macroeconomics. Aggregate demand is a country's total output, basically everything we produce and every service we provide. Aggregate demand is also known as gross domestic product, GDP for short. GDP is made up from everything we buy, everything we invest, everything the government spends on, and our net exports. Our aggregate demand graph is very similar to any demand graph seen in mac microeconomics. You may ask what that second line is. Well, that's our aggregate supply curve. The aggregate supply curve is split into three sections, the Keynesian range, the intermediate range, and the classical range. Where aggregate supply and aggregate demand intersect, this is our country's equilibrium. So as aggregate demand increases and decreases based on factors previously said, it can cause changes in price levels and also changes in total real output. When the AD curve shifts rightward in the Keynesian range, also known as the recessionary gap, there is an increase in real output but prices do not change. In the intermediate range, they both increase. And in the classical range, also known as the inflationary gap, when AD is shifted rightward, price levels increase but real output does not. With aggregate supply, when it decreases, it is shifted leftward, which increases price levels and decreases output. As previously mentioned, this is how governments are able to keep our inflation rate in check. By decreasing the government spending portion of aggregate demand, they can shift the curve leftward, which decreases price levels. Another way that governments manipulate the AD and AS curves is with monetary policy. With monetary policy, the Bank of Canada increases or decreases the money supply of the country, and by increasing or decreasing interest rates, they shift the aggregate demand curve left or right. When you hear on the news about money being printed constantly, you are hearing of the expansionary monetary policy. This is when they boost aggregate demand by increasing the supply of money. This is usually done when AD is in the recessionary gap, since it will not cause high inflation. The opposite holds true for contractionary monetary policy, which is done when AD is in the inflationary gap. When they say increase or decrease interest rates, they simply are trying to change the amount of money that people spend. You might have a credit card, and if you do, you know that the higher the interest rate on it, the more you have to pay in the end, therefore you're not going to spend as much, which means lower consumption and lower investment. We all know how the government affects aggregate demand and aggregate supply, but how do other countries affect it? Well, they do that through our exports and imports. I don't think I've seen a banana plantation anywhere around here, nor have I seen maple syrup being made in India. I can honestly say that every one of you has seen the part of the news where they talk about the value of our dollar. Blah blah blah, you might say, it's all just a bunch of numbers, but it really does affect us. Exchange rates are massive factors in our exports and imports. If our va dollar value is high, it will take more of another currency to purchase one Canadian dollar. Therefore, we're not going to export 
as much since it's more expensive to other countries. We also can get more of one currency for one Canadian dollar, which means we import more. This brings our overall net exports down. However, on the other side, if our dollar is low, our next net exports will be high. Remember how I told you Zimbabwe experienced hyperinflation? Well, one US dollar could get you around 2,622,000,000 Zimbabwe dollars. Now you have everything you need to know about macroeconomics. Just remember, instead of bringing a suitcase full of money to Zimbabwe, it might be easier just to bring that chocolate bar and start bartering with it.